and welcome to a new hatchery feed and management webinar, Innovations in Hatchery Feeds. My name is Lucia Barreiro, editor of Hatchery Feed and Management. Aquaculture technologies, hatcheries traditionally rely on rotifer and artemia as live feeds for the early larval stages. But technology is evolving and has allowed the industrial production of other live feed species and smaller dry feeds. Sea feed and Plantonic are two of the recent disruptors in live feeds. Both companies develop new nutritionally complete options for hatcheries. In terms of dry feeds, aquafit te manufacturing techniques have also evolved and are allowing hatchery managers to co-feed larvae at earlier stages. All these innovations have added new options to the feed basket case of hatcheries for improved quality and profitability. Today's webinar is sponsored by Seafeed and Plantonic. Each speaker will give a 20 minute presentation and then we will get to a final panel session to answer questions from the audience. To submit a question, please type it in the Q&A box. Special thanks to our assistant editor and webinar manager, Marisa Yanaga, for making all things work. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce you, George Komodorus, who will be moderating this webinar. George is professor in marine biology at the University of Crete. His research is focused on the environmental impacts on fish ontogeny and function, with a special emphasis on the phenotypic plasticity and skeletal abnormalities. His group has established long lasting collaborations with commercial fin fish hatcheries through EU funded projects and private initiatives aiming to the quality improvements of farmed fish and optimization of hatchery practices. George, I hand it over to you. You're on mute. Thank you very much, Lucia. Uh, the pleasure is mine. It's uh, really a pleasure to be uh, together with you uh, in this wonderful event. And I'm going uh, right now, starting introducing the speakers of today. Uh, the first speaker is going to be uh, Ryder Ramos. Ryder Ramos is Seafeed's commercial responsible for the EMEA region. Uh, he's a graduated aqua veterinarian from the Norwegian, Norwegian Life Science University. He has been involved in startups and scale up of land based, sea based, and pond based aquaculture ventures in different parts of the world. Ryder was previously a grouper producer and partner in a commercial marine hatchery in South America. He joined Seafeed in November 2021, and uh, he is responsible to execute Seafeed's uh, commercial strategy in the EMEA region and support marine hatcheries. The title of uh, today's uh, presentation is Sea Ponds, Flexible Larval Feed, Booster Supplement and or Substitute with Profound Effects on the full production cycle. Ryder, could you please share with us your screen? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mr. Komodurus, uh, thank you for the introduction, Lucy, as well. It's a great pleasure to be here representing a team or uh, the CFIT team that is, a, that is a team that is really working every day to make a change and to, 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 to contribute to the sustainable development of the aquaculture sector uh, worldwide. So today I'm going to have a short presentation about, about CPOTS, a, a flexible larval feed with profound effects in the full production cycle. Uh, the objective with this presentation is to address a couple of questions that uh, people that know uh, uh, about us or that do, do, uh, do not know uh, will find insightful and, and useful uh, for, their, for their productions uh, with different species. So in this presentation, uh, I will go through the who, who we are, uh, who we uh, are helping, uh, through our through our work and our uh, with our product, what is our product? When is uh, supposed to be used this product, and why uh, you should consider to to use sea feeds, uh, live feed uh, in 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 your commercial practices. So when it comes to the question who uh, sea feed is a is a Norwegian company. I'm uh, today in the headquarters of CFIT that is located in Trondheim, Norway. Our production facility is a couple of minutes by boat from Trondheim in, in, a, 
in a municipality that is called Van Beacon. There we have a land-based production a, a control and is actually aquaculture of copper pots itself. We are the world's first and only industrial copper pot producer and supplier in the world. Uh, and this is something of what we feel very proud because it's more than more than 20 years research and development, product development, and, and close collaboration with the academia, uh, research institutions, and the industry. We are a team of 25 uh, plus people with different nationalities, different backgrounds, distributed in different, in different departments from R&D going to the customer service, uh, um, going for um, com the commercial team, the production team, and of course, the administration team. Um, as you can see in the map, uh, Trondheim is located in the middle of the, co of the, of the, of the Norwegian coast. And uh, our, our clients are marine hatcheries around the world, aiming to improve uh, performance and profitability. I would like that Marisa would share uh, with you one short uh, video of one, one minute and a half, so you can get an idea uh, what is our product. And then from there, I will continue with uh, answering the, the rest of the questions. Marisa, could you please share the video? Our story begins with a group of Norwegian scientists that sought to unlock the secret of nature. The secret that flows within the ocean currents. Nature's first choice. A powerful organism containing the most vital nutrients for marine lava. Seafeed has inherited nature's wisdom to sustainably farm Akasha tonsa copepods in a controlled and biosecured environment. After many years of applied research, we provide marine aquaculture hatcheries all the benefits, essential nutrients, and power of nature concentrated in a bottle that contains millions of Akasha tonsa resting eggs. Sea pods, an easy to use, easy to transport and renewable larval starter feed solution. At the heart of each sea feed bottle is the soul of our visionary founders. Decades of hard work and commitment to produce a live feed superior to any other live feed in the market. Sea feed is leading the progress in larval nutrition, ensuring that marine aquaculture companies around the world achieve greater performance better welfare, and sustainable profitability. Sea Feed, feeding the blue future. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. So uh, basically, um, uh, as you could see, uh, CFIT is, is uh, the story of CFIT is, is a long story that is transferred and, and represented in a product, a product that, are, uh, that is called CPOTs. CPOTs are uh, CFIT's resting aquaculture copper pot X uh, of, a, of the species uh, Akarsha tonsa. Uh, approximately 100 million. Seapods uh, are uh, packed in a bottle, uh, as the one that you can see in my right, uh, that, that is one liter. Approximately 30% of, uh, of the content of this bottle are seapods, and 70% is a solution that maintains the copper pots in uh, the, the, the copper pot eggs in perfect status. This is a fresh product that is, um, that is stored in temperatures between one and four degrees. So the story behind this product, so how this product is produced. As I mentioned before, we are, we are offering the industry a solution by taking responsibility of farming a high quality live feed. A, a live quality live feed that has traceability to the microscopic level. We at CFEED produce our own microalgae to feed our copper pots. We have our own broodstock and we have uh, the copper pots that, that produce those eggs. Then we do the harvesting in a, very, in a, control, in a control environment. We, we, we follow a strict uh, biosecurity protocols 
and disinfection, disinfection process. Uh, so then uh, the best quality eggs are packed in each bottle. After, after collecting those eggs are stored and shipped to different hatcheries around the world that produce different species. After this product arrives to the hatchery, you only need to store it in a fridge in the temperatures that I mentioned before. And then when you decide to use it, uh, you only need to do a process of hatch and feed that will take approximately between 24 and 48 hours. Is it really important to mention that we are, we, we heritage uh, the nature wisdom to basically farm the natural prey for marine larvae, for marine larvae in the wild, which means that our product is a high quality starter feed that, um, that gives this traceability component and this biosecurity component. In addition, uh, our, our, our copper pot eggs, our seapots in after, after hatch, it has a unique nutritional profile, which is reflected in the, in the performance, robusticity, and growth of, of these larvae. Our, our value proposition is to simplify this first, this first but very crucial uh, phase, in, uh, phase in, in hatcheries. As you can see in, the, in, in my screen, so there is the traditional, the traditional uh, live feed uh, strategy that it starts with microalgae, passing to rotifers, and then going to Artemia to then continue with inert uh, feeds. And copper pots is a starter larval feed. So basically, our product is offering a solution in, this, in those first days post-hatch. So basically, it's the product that you will that you will that you as hatchery manager and, and, and hatchery producers will will use as the as the as the point of departure. This is a product that you as customer decide how you want to apply it, how you want to use it, and our our customer service team and our and our technical team will give you all the guidance and all the all the all the technical support so that you can adjust your strategy to your specific needs. One of those three ways to use the, to use the product is a substitution strategy. Basically, you instead of, 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 of producing your own rotifers all year round, you, uh, you use uh, our product, as that is a shelf product. We ship it to your hatchery. You keep it in the fridge. When you need it, you use it. Uh, this, is a, this is something very important to say. Our product, since it's fresh, is transport by is transport by by it can be transport by plane, road, or sea, um, and at the same time is is a product that uh, we have already the experience to to supply different countries, which means that everything is about good planification with our customers so they can get the product as fresh as possible and use it as as soon as possible. Other strategy is the boosting strategy, where you start with high levels of copper pots in the beginning to then continue with rotifers or other, or other substitution uh, product in the market. As well, we have a supplementation strategy that is a co-feeding strategy, where you combine a, a rotifers and other solutions as the ones that will be most likely presented in this webinar together with our product. So then you get the best of every single uh, solution that you use. Our objective in the industry is not to disrupt. Our objective is to contribute with, with, with a high quality product and make that every single solution that you use, will get, you will get the best of it. Why you should consider uh, our CPOTs as a, as a product in your hatchery? It is definitely a product that has documented results and uh, documented advantages. Is is no need of en for enrichment as the as the copper pot now contains the the nutrients, which means that if the, uh, as soon as far I mean, in the moment that the that the copper that the copper pot now now is in the in the water column, you won't lose the the nutritional value. And in addition, we'll keep the water quality in perfect check as you will not produce organic material. And you know that these first days are very crucial and, and is really important to, to maintain, not just, not just ensure nutritional value, but as well ensure a good environment. As I mentioned before, our production is biosecure. We 
uh, we have different different disinfection process in the in the in the production in the production line uh, after harvesting before before packing and then in addition to the standard protocols uh, we have we have a protocols of uh, before hatching that, that the customer can do a disinfection disinfection process as well in addition every single bottle that leaves our facility is tested by a third party laborator, uh, laboratory which ensures that the that the that the product doesn't contain any any pathogen that would represent a risk for for your facility it's easy to use easy to transport and it's less work for the employees which means that a uh, this precious time that a uh, hatchery staff has could be used in 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 attending a uh, instead of of, of, of having unnecessary labor, we are contributing that this staff could be focused in what matters and we do our, our best to, to, to support this work. As you can see in the left side uh, picture, uh, you see how digestible is our product, uh, is, is, is our product uh, in, in, in fish larvae. In the left side, you can see a larvae fed with, uh, with, with seapods in the, in the same, of the same batch that the one that was fed with traditional live feed with rotifers. The documented result is one of the big strategies that CFIT has, uh, has done. We really want to come with a solution that is already tested, it's already proved, and it's already, it's already, already giving the necessary information to our customers to, to, to use it in the, in the best possible way. It, it, although we have used uh, our product in different species, we found a trend and a tendency that doesn't matter in which species our product is used, you uh, customers or, or, or larvae experience better survival, better growth rates, better F uh, feed conversion ratio, not just in the hatchery, but as well in, in the growing phase, better swim bladder inflation, fewer deformities and homogeneous growth. As you can see in the left side, in the upper left side, you see two groups, uh, okay, actually two groups uh, from the same batch of seriola uh, that has been fed with traditional uh, live feed in the right and with our product in the left. And this small detail of homogeneity is not just a benefit for the hatchery, but for the old, for the development of these of this, of this aquaculture operations, because it reduces labor it reduces it reduces unnecessary work in grading uh, and of course improve the fish welfare of the of the of the animals so we have we have we are we are currently working and we are really proud to contribute to as many marine marine value chains as possible uh, as you can see in the screen we are working with seabring cod flatfish tuna grouper uh, seriola and balan race in, in, in the Nordics. Um, each, in, each of those species that we are working has uh, already documented report, uh, documented uh, uh, lit literature and, 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 and documented results that can be proof uh, and that different, uh, different groups have, have worked and validate our, our, our commercial statements. I took some examples of, of, of different literature, but if you are interested, please don't, do not hesitate to contact our customer service team. I will show you our email, our email, and you can always feel free to contact us or visit us if you are coming to Aquanur. So basically, when it, when it comes to, to Brim, we already are in a commercial phase and we are, we are, we are linked this, linking this into a, a hard work in research and development. And we are about, we are soon, we are going to um, publish soon some results. It's results that will show uh, the impact that our product has on the hatchery, but as well in the ongoing phase. And we are really, really happy and looking forward to, to share this. And believe me, as soon as we have it, a publish, we, you will be informed. And there will be different articles and different seminars uh, linked to the CFIT Academy uh, arena. When it, comes to, when it comes to COD, we are fully commercial, uh, supporting, uh, supporting our, our Norwegian uh, clients. 
Uh, Seriola, we are really uh, working together with producers that are already in the scale up phase or that are starting their, their process. As former grouper producers, so I must tell you that I was before uh, in, the, in the customer side and that I work for CFIT is a great pleasure because I saw with my, with my own eyes how this live feed, how, how a proper uh, starter feed can make a change in the full value chain. And yes, it's, it's a lot to talk. Unfortunately, we are limited uh, with time. So first of all, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, in the screen, you can see our, our contact details from me in the, in the commercial side and from Nikos from the customer service side. Do not hesitate to send us an email uh, if you want to book a meeting with us so we can go deeper into the topics uh, we will be more than happy uh, to do that. And in this question and answer session, so Nikos will be there uh, ready to answer as many questions as he can. And in case that we are not able to, to, to go through absolutely all the questions, so you know our email addresses, you know where we are located, and we are really happy to visit and to, to give you as much, in, in, as much information so you can have a, a documented and, and secure decision if you want to try all our product and if you want to see uh, the impact that our product ha have, uh, has with uh, your own eyes. Thank you. And yes, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ryder. It was really uh, uh, an interesting talk. I learned quite a lot of uh, new things concerning the copper pods uh, uh, and their use in marine hatcheries, and not only. Uh, now I would like to ask uh, Nils Tockel to, to get uh, ready. Uh, Nils, Nils is CTO and co-founder of Planktonic. He's responsible for product development and application of products for marine larvae. Uh, he has a PhD in marine ecology with a focus on plankton. The title of his presentation is Intensteins of Fish Juveniles as an Indicator of Improved Long-Term Growth and Robustness. Nils, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, uh, Georgios. So uh, this talk will uh, focus on uh, intestines of fish juveniles. We fed cryoplankton and the response in uh, growth and, uh, and development. So, uh, yeah, uh, just to say something about uh, our products. We are producing uh, live feed that are stored in uh, liquid nitrogen and sent to the uh, customers by uh, fish, uh, by road or, uh, or, or plane even. Uh, and then the end user or customer can uh, uh, throw it at site and uh, they will revive again and uh, become live organisms. And uh, we have two types. They are both uh, offspring or barnacles. Cryo small uh, can replace uh, rotifers and cryo large can replace uh, Artemia. Uh, cryo large is also available in inert form as uh, feed for shrimp larvae. Uh, which make uh, logistics even more simple. And that can be fed from Suea 3 and uh, Mysis uh, to PL 3 to, to, to 5. And then we have uh, plankton eggs. That's a new product. That's an inert feed uh, with size of 70 micron. That's uh, suitable for uh, small mounted species like, uh, uh, like uh, as grouper and snappers, but also uh, uh, work for uh, for shrimp larvae from uh, from Suea one stage. So uh, marine crustacean uh, nauplia is considered as the gold standard in in larvae culture. We try to enrich uh, rotifers and atemia, but we don't reach the gold standard uh, fully. Uh, so here we don't need any enrichment. This is a natural prey. Uh, which uh, fish are evolutionarily ad adapted to prey upon, so we think it's optimal. Uh, Hufas, uh, like DHA and EPA, are stored in the phospholipids, uh, not in the storage lipids like the rotifers and artemia do. And that's uh, make a huge difference because the fish can better exploit the phospholipids. 
the biochemical profile of copper pots and, uh, and barnacle uh, nuclei, they are very similar. So we call uh, cryoplankton the industrial version of copper pots. And since 2016, the market uh, has absorbed uh, nearly 100 tons of cryoplankton. So it's uh, well tested. And we have the full uh, North European market uh, for kingfish, for uh, Atlantic cod, for balanrest. And now we are expanding to South Europe and overseas to Asia and Americas. So we have a lot of trials going on, uh, very promising ones. So what's the problem with the uh, rotifers and aphelia? So we, they can store a limited amount of, uh, of EFAS in the phospholipids, like the upper two graphs here are showing, uh, phospholipid compartments in uh, rotifers and uh, natural plankton. Uh, and uh, you can see here that uh, if you see the arrow here, uh, you see natural plankton have a lot of DHA and EPA in the phospholipid compartment, while uh, the rotifers and rich in uh, several ways are uh, don't have much DHA and EPA. They store it in the storage lipid rather, which are uh, less efficient for the fish larvae. And the same goes for Arcadia. Here you see the phospholipid classes PC and PE. Uh, take some hours to enrich the Artemia to get uh, some small percentage of DHA in the phospholipid compartments. But in the quartankton, it's more stable. Uh, if it's uh, zero hours or uh, 30, 40 hours, it's the same level of uh, DHA and EPA in the phospholipids. Uh, so uh, I have to stress that it's a lot of UFAS uh, in, in enriched uh, rotifers and Artemia, but they are in the always in the store which lipids and another thing is that uh, when you enrich a uh, live feed uh, they are quickly lost in the fish tank that could cause a problem uh, with the bacteria because that's a perfect feed for for bacteria and uh, and roti first they contain a small amount of, of taurine uh, this is an essential nutrient for uh, optimal development, and uh, cryoplankton have the adequate amount of that uh, that component. We also see that uh, rotifers and artemia they uh, have a very low omega three to omega six uh, ratio, which is about uh, two to one uh, versus twenty five to one for cryoplankton, and that's typical for a natural uh, marine plankton uh, adapted for fish larvae. And which rotifers and Artemia, they have a huge variation in the biochemical composition, even from hour to hour. And uh, that's a huge uh, advantage for the uh, cryoplankton, which also always are constant. So then you can have a more predictable production in the hatchery. So uh, one unique uh, selling point here is the biosecurity. Uh, here you see the uh, CFU, uh, colony forming units in uh, cryoplankton before cryopreservation. Uh, this is very low amount. Uh, we are extracting eggs from uh, barnacles and eggs are in principle sterile. So you could say that uh, it's the outside that could uh, contain uh, some small amount of uh, bacteria. But after cryopreservation, when we are using an anti-freeze agent and uh, freezing down to minus 196, then you reduce the bacteria more than 90%. So uh, you see it's uh, very low compared to a rotifers and Artemia. So uh, it's on a different planet. It could be far less than this and uh, more than this in rotifers and Artemia that varies between hatcheries. But uh, uh, it's important to hear that uh, it's so huge difference between uh, in, between cryoplankton and rotifers Artemia. The petri dishes you see here on the picture, they are, uh, uh, this is a rotifer culture on a non-selective agar uh, showing the, uh, the colonies of, uh, of bacteria. This is diluted also. And uh, on the left side here, you have a non-diluted uh, cryoplankton stored for 48 hours uh, after toying. Then you should expect some bacteria to grow, but it's uh, not many. And uh, here they are both uh, diluted, and uh, you can in total see 
five bacteria in uh, in the cryoplankton uh, culture, and uh, while you still have a lot in the rotifer culture, so this is from a commercial hatchery that have been operated for tens of years, so they know what they are doing. And uh, we have been sequencing uh, those bacteria, and we see that they are harmless bacteria. And uh, we see from literature that uh, the species have even been used as probiotics in, in uh, larvae culture. And uh, in opposite to the uh, rotifer culture, you have a mostly fast growing opportunistic bacteria that are stressing the fish and uh, leads to mortality in the fish tank. So uh, what's the response on the organs development when you uh, when you have optimal feed and, and uh, good uh, biosecurity? We see that uh, it's typical that you get uh, longer, larger surface, so villi, microvilli, and epithelium in the cells in the gut. There is a uh, balanbras in the Tintrev study, significant uh, different from the others. You have uh, quad here. Uh, this is uh, day uh, 20 after hatching. And here you see the rocket percentage. Uh, the villi are still under formation, while on the right side here, uh, it's uh, more developed. And the same goes for other species. Uh, here you have uh, sea bream, a better development of the uh, of the gut, and uh, you see that at day 43, it's even uh, more difference on, on the on the gut, and that's uh, long after we stopped uh, adding cryoplankton. So this is uh, an effect uh, you see when it uh, it's weaned to dry feed and uh, it's exploiting the dry feed much better, and uh, that leads to better growth and uh, development. And as it exploited dry feed better, you could save live feed because you could shorten the live feed periods. And uh, then you could save a lot of cost uh, for reducing uh, arteria and, uh, or other type of live feeds. And the other important thing is that you see more goblet cells in the gut of the sea bream that were fed uh, cryoplankton. Uh, so, uh, 27, it had uh, almost double amount of goblet cells, and uh, this is mucus uh, producing cells that are in the gut from uh, external stressors like uh, bacteria and uh, also uh, mechanical damage from uh, from dry feeds. Uh, it also has the function that it, uh, it digests uh, the feed better. So uh, and then it's also lead to higher survival. So we have also done uh, similar analysis on sea bass and see the similar uh, pattern on, on this uh, response on the organs. We also see that uh, the liver, uh, here you have uh, Atlantic cod, uh, you have more uh, lipid vacuoles in the, in the liver of the Atlantic cod that were fed the cryoplankton, and this is a significant difference from the control. And the same goes for uh, for uh, sea bream uh, on the on the left side here, and uh, the day forty three you even have more difference. Uh, so that uh, means that the, the gut is absorbing better the dry feed, and you see the response on the liver. The same goes for the eye development. Uh, you see that. Uh, on the left side here, you have uh, far less uh, cells on the different layers of the eye, and that, uh, that's a rotifer fed fish. And on the right picture, you have uh, more cells and uh, more developed eye, and that's uh, probably because of the DHA in the phospholipid form that is uh, better for, uh, for developing the neural system in the fish. And uh, the gills as well, you see uh, goblet cells, almost double amount of goblet cells in the cryo-fed uh, fish at day 43. And that's also important for protecting the, the gills from, uh, from bacterial attacks and also from, from the dry feeds. All this together leads to better digestion growth development. So in all you save uh, live feeds, shorten the, uh, the live feed period and you can do earlier weaning as we already do for uh, uh, several species like uh, like yeah, and, and balan rats.
Oh, we see the growth potential when we uh, have this optimal feed and uh, with the uh, better gut health and, uh, and liver status. Uh, the upper graph here is uh, it's an ongoing study at IFME. This is an Aqua Excel project. Uh, so uh, here we are comparing two experimental treatments with the control. Uh, so the control is uh, French protocol, uh, starting with the with the small strain uh, artemia, AF artemia, and then you continue with enriched uh, artemia. Uh, but here the I'll dry the blue one uh, that is uh, has uh, no artemia in it, and it's also weaned to uh, to dry feed much earlier than uh, normal. And uh, you start with quite small, then quite large, uh, no artemia at all in this one. And you see at some point here, the growth rate is actually 50, 60% better than the uh, control fish. Uh, now at day 160, it uh, flattens a little bit out, or, or 10, 14%. And uh, it will continue to, uh, to the fish are 250 grams, so that will be in uh, maybe in October or so. Uh, so we hope to see the same trend that the fish will be uh, 10 15 percent larger than the, the control. You see the other treatment here, cryo A, A. it's uh, also cryo S from the start and then cryo L, and then we continue with Artemia. So that's a more mild but uh, it gives almost the same effect uh, as, uh, as uh, replacing all artemia. So uh, we see the same trend for all species. Uh, you see uh, the sea beam here, uh, two different uh, commercial hatcheries. They also see a huge difference in growth. And here you have a sea bass at a different uh, hatchery. So, uh, with this uh, plankton, you will uh, reduce uh, both fixed and variable costs in the hatchery, and also uh, when you transfer the fish to sea cage or, or land based ross. And uh, of course, you could uh, have a, a fish that weigh more at the slaughtering phase, or you could shorten the uh, production time in, in the cages. We also expect to reduce the FTR because of more efficient conversion to from uh, dry feed to, uh, to growth. Uh, for the fish, and also a reduction in the mortality, as we see. Uh, we have a long suspect that uh, the fish that uh, eat uh, cryoplankton get a better immune system. And uh, finally, now we have uh, documented it. It's an excellent study from uh, Institute of Marine Research, Norway. Uh, this is a doctoral degree, a PhD degree. It was uh, published uh, one or two weeks ago. So uh, if you Google uh, the timers and uh, T-cell ontogeny in Balanres, you will uh, find this paper and it's uh, for free. You could uh, download it for free and uh, read it uh, more in detail. Uh, so uh, in this study, Balanres fed the rotifers and artemia versus cryoplankton. And you see from the upper uh, graphs here, uh, the uh, left and right side uh, timers were both uh, developed uh, earlier. So uh, here we have a stage four, five, six. So, uh, stage four is day uh, 30 to 40 days. So you see that uh, here the uh, tumors, which are producing T cells, were uh, developed earlier than the control pitch. And, uh, at later stages, it was significantly larger than the uh, control, um, both the left and right side uh, tumors. And uh, also uh, different T cell markers uh, revealed by molecular methods, uh, they were affected by the diet. And uh, we, all of those markers, we saw the increased activity for the prior group, uh, meaning that we have a higher T cell production. So this is a documentation of a better immune system for of the fish that were fed cryo. So that uh, I think this is a general trend because we always see more robust uh, larvae when we feed the cryoplankton. 
So a uh, lot of hatcheries have done uh, stress tests themselves, uh, testing the fish uh, that were fed cryoplankton. And uh, on the y-axis there, you have the mortality and uh, you have uh, time and uh, the stressor where uh, higher uh, salinity temperature and also density of the larvae. And uh, for all species there, for balanrats, Zebrin, uh, two tests there, and, and for Zebas, you always have higher mortality for the fish uh, in the control. While the fish that are feeding near cryoplankton, you always have lower mortality. And that's probably because of the better gut health and immune system, you get a more robust larvae. So maybe as a consequence of the, of the better immune system and the gut health, uh, we see a reduced uh, defects on the fish that uh, are fed cryoplankton. Uh, University of Patras have uh, analyzed some, uh, some fish at uh, different hatcheries and uh, they see a dramatic reduction in deformities uh, on sea bass. Uh, for instance, this uh, rate of deformity uh, at the hatchery, commercial hatchery, you see 28% for the control and 4% for the cryoplankton per fish. And that uh, means you don't need to sort out these fish because uh, hatcheries often have a the threshold of four uh, percent. If it's less than four percent, they don't uh, grade the fish and, and sort out the, uh, the uh, deformed fish. So that will save a lot of uh, person uh, hours at the hatchery. I also see uh, an increased presence of uh, flexion, uh, which is a trend for uh, no skeletal deformities. That's also uh, significantly better for the cryoplankton fed fish. Uh, the uh, trial we are doing now at Ifremer, uh, at uh, day 160, they looked at the deformities and uh, saw that operculum deformities was 16.8% in the control versus 0.2% in the cryoplankton fed fish. They say that 16.8% uh, is uh, higher than, uh, than normal, but uh, anyway, this is a comparison between treatments and that's uh, the most important that uh, you are reducing uh, the deformities uh, almost to zero in this, uh, this uh, trial. We see also uh, better pigmentation in, in flatfish. Uh, as you see in this, uh, those two pictures, the right picture is See that uh, you have some dark fish that are malpigmented and they have to be sorted out uh, manually. And uh, the picture on the left side uh, show fish that are fed cryoplankton and, uh, and they are perfectly pigmented. So no need for sorting out of fish. So we have quite good documentation now on, on deformities on fish and the effect that cryo gives. We have also done some uh, small uh, trials on uh, on uh, Vaname shrimps uh, with very good uh, results, and uh, the, uh, we see a better growth and survival. And this is probably due to uh, the better gut health and, uh, and immune system, as uh, seen on fish juvenile fed cryoplankton. So I, maybe the same mechanisms are playing here as in fish, and. Uh, that's important for uh, for the uh, shrimp industry because a uh, lot of producers they struggle with uh, with diseases so this uh, might help a lot uh, for that and an optimal starter diet that uh, is uh, for sure important and uh, will probably give long-term effects on the shrimp and the inner diets we have for shrimp the plankton eggs can be fed from soya one uh, inert barnacolnopia from uh, Stua 3 and, uh, and up to PL5. And those are very easy to uh, transport because uh, they can be shipped in a styrofoam box like this on plane or, or in a reefer container on, on the ship or, or truck. So, uh, and uh, they are very easy to feed also. You just add water and, uh, and throw them and add directly to the, the, the larval tank. 
So to sum up here, we see that uh, the optimal nutrition in cryoplankton and the better biosecurity of, uh, of the cryoplankton gives a positive impact on the gut health. We see that you have a better feed uptake of the dry feed also and, and the gut barrier protection. And that uh, results in uh, better growth rates, but also survival as it protects against bacteria. And, and mechanical damage from uh, from the dry feed. And uh, we see a better immune system, uh, earlier development of tumors, and uh, uh, much higher T cell activity. That uh, will result in, in better survival and more robust larvae. And maybe as a consequence of the gut health and better immune system, you have uh, also reduced defects. So thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Nils. This was a really interesting uh, and informative presentation. Thank I you. I would like now to move on. To uh, Joanna Maral. Joanna is Biomars Global Product Manager for Marine Fish Hatcheries. She manages and develops the Marine Fish Larviva product portfolio at a global level. Before joining Biomars, she gained solid knowledge and hands-on experiences in the hatchery and the marine uh, segments. She was hatchery manager for more than 20 years, working in different private companies in Portugal, Cyprus, UK, and Spain, with different marine fish species and always striving for improvement. Uh, the title of her talk is Early Co-Feeding Equals to Better Larvae, I Suppose... This is a clear question mark, Joanna, so please take the, the floor. Thank you, Georgos, and thank you for the, the invitation to talk a bit about uh, the innovations in hatchery feeds, the focus on the early co-feeding uh, with the dry feeds. Now, when we talk about uh, innovations in hatcheries, it only makes sense that it, it actually addresses the issues and the objectives of the of the hatcheries. So. So if we if we think about the hatchery and, the, and the, the cycle of production of the hatchery, starting from broodstock all the way to fry, the, the, the critical objective of the hatchery is actually to assure quality, robust, and performing fry for the grow-out stages. And this usually is validated through a good biological performance in the hatchery, and we talk about survival, growth, and deformities. It is very true as well that once you get to this stage, you really want to increase your productivity, reduce the production costs, ensure a stable production of results, which sometimes is the key uh, uh, parameter to, to look for, and as much as possible, uh, simplify the, the production process. Now, the hatcheries are complex environments and are, uh, to achieve the success, there's a lot of parameters playing a role from egg quality, uh, from broodstock condition, and also genetic selection programs, there's a huge impact. We also have, of course, the infrastructure, the water quality, so all the biotic and the biotic parameters play a huge role. But the single most important for me, it's also the team and how people in the hatcheries are able to deal with all the, uh, the other parameters. And of course, you have feeds, and as important of the, as uh, the feed is actually how we do the feeding. We can have the best larval feed in the world. If we don't actually feed properly, we're not going to go uh, anywhere. So really, it's the combination of all these very important factories that will make the success of the hatcheries. And this is what we have uh, to address on a, on a daily basis. Now, when it comes to feed and feeding, uh, if we go back to, to the nature, the marine larvae, will eat on a mixture of uh, phytoanthroplankton. And of course, when we go to more intensive conditions into marine hatcheries, then we need to find solutions to produce or to get hold of uh, in large scale and in control conditions. And we produce artemia, we produce rotifers, we produce or outsource, outsource the marine algae, and also uh, now, as you heard, uh, barnacles and um, copepods. But in an ideal world, we actually wanted to jump for feet. Now, let me take the elephant out of the room. 
I am not going to talk about total replacement of Lightweed. We're not there yet. This is not the innovation that we're talking uh, today, hopefully in the future. And this is still the holy grail of the of the marine hatcheries to, to get there. But there's several different um, points that are still holding us back. First of all, there are still uh, black boxes in terms of the nutritional requirements of larvae. There are also black boxes, even if we supply the requirements, how do they assimilate and how do they assimilate in different conditions? And there's things related to how stable particles are compared to how available the nutrients uh, become and how do we use and how do we feed uh, the particles because there is a paradigm set change and I'll go there uh, more in a minute. But having said all this, there has been uh, a lot of important uh, uh, developments. So the dry feeds have evolved uh, over time and we have had quite a bit of, uh, of innovation. First of all, uh, and going back to the production of the feeds and when we look at innovations, we are looking at three main different parameters that need to work very closely together and are completely interlinked on what we do in one and the other. So starting with the fulfillment of the nutritional requirements, we need to have an optimal level and balance of both macro and micronutrients. And there has been indeed quite a bit of development on the last uh, uh, few years. We know, although there are still a lot of black boxes, we know a lot more than we used to, to, to know, especially on micronutrients and especially on, on vitamins and, and minerals. And there has been a huge amount of work in terms of physical uh, and chemical characteristics of the feeds. So to allow us to have a feed that we can control the smell, the taste, how will it taste to, to the larvae? How will they be attracted to these uh, particles? Of course, we need and we are able today to control also how, uh, how is the color? How is the particle size distribution? How is the shape? And even more important, how does this particle behave uh, in the water? And how is it stable also in the water? And all of this, both the nutritional and the physical characteristics are very interlinked with the process. And there has been also big steps forward in terms of process control, in terms of selection and control of raw materials. And even within the process, either microencapsulation, agglomeration, uh, cold extrusion, there are quite a few different steps that are uh, new or renew different ways of looking at old technologies and new technologies as well that we've been exploring and uh, applying. So this to get to the point that today uh, we have feeds that are actually, we are able to feed the larvae from, from the moment that we start feeding uh, externally. So larvae are actually attracted and they ingest feed particles from mouth opening. And this allows us to do and start uh, dry foods uh, from mouth opening. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we can totally replace live feed. And I want to, to, to stress this. What we're looking for, it's the right balance between the live feed and the dry feed. We have done several tests uh, here. For example, you have with, um, with sea bass larvae, and we know that we can go very low with your team. In this case, we went as low as 12 kilos of vertemia per million fry produced uh, without compromising the formities and survival. But we know that if we start to go lower, then we will start having issues, especially in terms of uh, the formities, we will see uh, uh, problems. So what we've tried to do is start working or feeding or finding this correct balance between the live feed and the, and the dry feed and doing this by starting to feed the dry feed exactly on the start of feeding of the different species. So we went on to do several different trials with several different species. We focused on sea brim in red brim and sea bass. We did it in semi industrial conditions, very controlled in our facilities. And we also did it with customers. So in, in commercial uh, conditions. And the idea is to actually try to answer the question. If we do this early co-feeding, if we start feeding uh, from the onset of external feeding compared 
to a more traditional feeding, does it actually give better larvae? And what we have seen across all these trials and across this, this uh, species, is that it actually does. So we have seen increased survival, we have seen higher growth, we have seen in all the trials without exception, uh, lower deformity levels in the fish that were co-fed uh, from, uh, from start of feeding, uh, a much uh, higher uniformity of sizes, so a lower CV, and of course this then gives you an easier and faster weaning, and very important, it reduces the dependency on live feed. So you actually uh, need to feed less uh, live feed and you take a lot of the stress and a lot of the pressure out of the parallel productions of rotifers and artemia. Now, we wanted also to stress out that in all of the trials that we've done with all the species, what we have seen as well, and documented by evaluating the digestive enzymes that we have seen an earlier maturation of the digestive guts. And another thing that we did in some of the trials, and here is an example with uh, with CBAS, is that if we expose host larvae uh, to an hydrodynamic challenge, so to currents, higher currents and higher densities in, in this case, we can see that the formities like the hemolar doses are much more prevalent in the fish that were co-fed later than the early uh, co-feeding. So we have much uh, higher sensitivity than on the, the early uh, co-feeding. And this tells us that whatever we are doing actually in the larval stages will carry on uh, uh, on the later stages. And also in some trials we have seen uh, when we had the opportunity to monitor the growth in the later stages, that the growth advantages that we had seen in the larval trials were actually maintained also throughout the, the production cycle. Meaning that when we do the co-feeding strategies and when we, we focus on the early feeding, we not only get better larvae, but we even get better fish throughout the, the production cycle. But why? And what is actually behind it? How do we, do we look at it and how do we uh, explain it? Well, we covered that we are actually able, first of all, to feed and to have the, the ingestion of particles from mouth opening. Uh, we also believe that when we are supplying uh, the larvae with particles of the dry feed of prostax, we are actually giving a much higher density of nutrients and the larvae have to spend a lot less energy looking for more particles to get the same amounts of, uh, of uh, nutrients. We are also supplying from day one a very balanced and stable nutrition. And these two words are very important in terms of balance and stable is actually what we are able to provide the larvae. We know that live heat can fluctuate. We know that even the best enriched live heat has this daily fluctuation of nutritional uh, value. And here we are consistently uh, meeting the nutritional needs uh, of the larvae from a very, very early stage. We also know that when we work with rotifers of the artemia, uh, especially in high densities, the risk of bringing to the larval tanks a big uh, microbiology impact is quite critical. Uh, usually uh, both Rotifers and archemia can carry into your tanks a lot of vibrio. And by reducing this amount and reducing the pressure that we have on the live feed, we are much more stable and able to control this uh, microbiology uh, management. Also, very importantly, that we believe that it's contributing to these uh, better results is that we have in the, in the ProStart the inclusion of a probiotic. We have the Bactocell that it's actually the only probiotic approved to use in feeds in, in Europe. And it's this inclusion and the way that the Bactocell works allows also for much better results if we do it from the initial stage. The Bactocell works through competitive exclusion, so competing for in the water and in the guts for space, for nutrients and for oxygen with other bacteria allows for uh, uh, much less colonization of undesirable bacteria that we have on the guts. 
It also, at the gut level, it produces, it promotes an immune modulation. So we have a, a much better gut integrity and external varial shield. So we have a much better uh, response. And then there are, it is documented with the Pacto cell, we have an improved uh, nutrient uptake. So the gut performance is increased. And this improved nutrient uptake will actually give you better results in terms of survival, growth, and, and uh, less deformities. Now, as I said before, also there is this earlier maturation of the digestive system. And what do we, how can we explain it through the co-feeding and the early introduction? So what we believe is that by providing specific nutrients and dietary components, we are able to promote the expression and activity of essential enzymes. So through the level and type of proteins, through the level and type of lipids, and through the micronutrients that we are supplying in the diets at a very early stage, we're actually able to promote this earlier maturation. In the protein, it's very easy to understand that uh, these larvae, uh, as immature as they are, they, are, they need very uh, small proteins. They are not able to have um, yet to digest uh, bigger proteins and they need the amino acids as uh, building blocks. So the type, quality and quantity of the protein does impact this enzyme uh, development. And by choosing and using high quality and easily digestible protein sources, we are actually promoting the modulation of digestive enzymes, enhancing the gut morphology, so like the villi uh, um, structures, and also influencing on the gut uh, motility. Lipids, I mean, we have heard previously with Niels in terms of phospholipids. Phospholipids are fundamental for, uh, for the marine larvae. Uh, but again, the type of phospholipids and the level and the ratios of phospholipids is, is very critical. And by supplying these earlier in the right proportion and at, at the right stage, we can actually improve the maturation of the, the guts and also some of these phospholipids can serve as substrate for some of the lipase uh, enzymes and stimulate the lipase uh, activity. Micronutrients uh, are a complicated uh, topic. Uh, they are extremely important. The minerals and vitamins, uh, not only the quantities, but also the balance between them and more than just the quantities, the bioavailability. I mean, there's, there's a lot of work done within the, the, within the, the development of micro diets in terms of which bioavailable forms and which delivery systems are actually better to use for the, for the larvae. So this is the reason. Uh, or these are some of the reasons why we actually believe that, in fact, uh, the early co-feeding is giving better larvae and better fish. Now, is this enough to carry on? Is this enough to have full protocols for early co-feeding strategies and to reduce even more the life feeds? We believe that there's a lot of other things and a lot of other innovations that need to work in parallel. And these to address the uniqueness of each of the hatcheries, because each hatchery is actually unique. But we need to think on how to feed and how to feed dry particles need to be in the same range of how we're feeding live feed. Today, we're thinking how many uh, rotifers and how many artemia per ml do we need to supply the larvae? Because the visual system, everything is so developed that these larvae almost need to bump into them. It's the same with the particles. We need to start working with number of particles and be very clear on the number of meals. The tanks hydrodynamics, the water renovation will have to be addressed in a different, in a different way. And for all of this, we need to start thinking outside the box in terms of automatic larval feeders or systems. We need to start thinking of automation on bottom and surface tank cleaning. And we need to start collecting data and do data management and taking decision based on, on uh, the extraordinary amount of data that we can collect in, in, the, in, the, in the hatcheries. And artificial intelligence is at uh, our door now, and I think there is room to huge innovation improvements uh, through uh, AI. 
So, as a take-home message in a, and in a nutshell, introducing Larvia Pro Start from mouth opening together with live feed is a safe and effective uh, protocol for several marine species. It does promote better biological and economical performance. It promotes stability and reliability of production and results. It has shown significant positive impacts on post-larval production stages. And we believe that this is achieved by promoting an earlier maturation of the digestive system and making the larvae more efficient on the nutrient uptake and usage. The complete replacement of live feeds will require further innovative solutions, both on larval feeds, but also on how to use these feeds. And yes, early co-feeding equals better larvae and equals better fish. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna, for answering this question. I was really stressed when I saw it on your title. Uh, I'm joking, of course. So uh, we can pass to the Q&A uh, session, I think. We will have together with us uh, uh, Mr. Nikos uh, Mitrizakis. Uh, he was introduced uh, uh, before by his colleague in CFID. Uh, I have collected some questions. Uh, uh, from the audience with respect uh, to the speech of the different uh, presenters. Uh, I have some questions which are uh, common for at least two of the presenters, and I would like to start by this. I have a, a question for CFID and planktonic products. Uh, they would like to ask uh, about the percentage of hatching rate of their products and whether this percentage of uh, hatching rate is affected by the uh, storage uh, duration and the transportation duration of these products to the hatcheries. Can we start uh, by uh, Ryder? Or Nikos? Nikos, do you want to take this one? Yes, of course. Uh, of course, the, uh, I have already answered also the, this question, Georgos, in the Q&A chat room. Uh, the product that we sell uh, is uh, hatchable eggs. So the customer will pay for the hatchable eggs, the amount that uh, goes with the packing list. Uh, of course, if uh, the customer, for whatever, uh, need to keep uh, our bottles in the fridge for a long time, uh, you can uh, calculate around a 5% uh, reduced hatching rate per week. But this, you can start counting from after the two weeks, for the first two weeks. So I mean that you will receive the product, let's say you buy 100 million, you will have a hundred million for two weeks, and after the first two weeks, you will start uh, calculate five percent uh, reducing hatching rate per week. Thank you very much, Nikos and uh, Nils. What about the products of planktonic? Yeah, so uh, the cryoplankton are stored in liquid uh, liquid nitrogen, so the shelf life is infinite. So you can uh, theoretically store it for many thousand years. And you always get the same result when you tow it. And they are uh, already uh, hatched uh, when you uh, when you cryopreserve them, and, and some uh, hatched uh, when you tow them. So uh, so they are uh, yeah they are all alive uh, when you you tow them. Uh, some are moving better than others, but uh, they are uh, at least moving and and show uh, vitality. So. Uh, so that is, is a huge advantage because you can store uh, a lot of, uh, of feed on, on doers and, uh, and you can store them for man, many, many years. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to go on with the second question, which is for all of you, uh, Biomar included. I will start this time by Joanna uh, and I will stick on what uh, she said in one of her last uh, uh, slides, its hatchery is unique. And all the people uh, in this audience, I believe that they know that. 
even if they are the same species with the same methodology, they are different. And uh, there is a question for all of you, and I would like Joanna to uh, start answering this question. Uh, do the use of these products demand by the hatchery significant changes in their production protocols and operating procedures? Joanna, would you like to start? Yes, of course. I would say yes and no. It depends, uh, as everything in life. But um, we usually the way that we start that we like to to work with the with the hatcheries is together with them, is to understand how best actually we can apply first to the way that uh, they they work and understanding their limitations, their protocols, uh, because they are there for a reason, the way that, uh, uh, that the way that they used to work. But of course, uh, in some cases you need to adjust. There's no way that we can start feeding earlier without doing, with, with dry feed, without doing some adaptations, especially when it comes to water renovation, especially when it comes to feeding times and how to address. So, there is a mixture, and here the, the, my answer is you need to be able to communicate. We need to be able to understand the uniqueness of these hatcheries and try to accommodate what are really the necessities and try to come up with, with a together solution, let's say. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Nils, would you like to continue on that? Yeah, I agree with uh, Joanna there. We are also communicating with the uh, hatchery staff and uh, that's important for developing the protocols at the hatcheries. And uh, each hatchery are quite unique. We need to do uh, often some adaptations. Uh, some uh, would uh, like a full uh, replacement of uh, life feed and, and for others uh, we have a partly uh, replacement of rotifers and artemia and uh, that you could also very, give uh, very good results so it's uh very dependent on species and, and location and everything okay Ryder, would you please assist us with your products so i will start i will start by saying that our objective is to offer a flexible solution so our objective is to disrupt as less as possible the operations and bring along a, a solution that would not need any additional hidden cost in terms of storage, in terms of equipment, in terms of routines. So as, as a former producer, I understand that uh, when you bring anything new, it will always demand an investment. So then you need the, the flexibility of the product that allows you to introduce it in a way that would not have any, any substantial financial and operative cost, but it will have substantial results in terms of a performance and profitability. I don't know if Nikos has something to add. Uh, I would just uh, want to say uh, something uh, about the hatching procedure that uh, we follow for the for the seapods. Uh, it is really easy uh, uh, to use, and uh, one important thing that it is that uh, there is no uh, need for extra equipment because uh, you just you, you just need to uh, open the bottle. I, I always have some. Uh, Copy pods in my house for my own use. Uh, so just open the bottle, uh, rinse the, the the media that it is uh, in the in the, in the bottle, uh, and use one of the existing uh, uh, tanks in the hatchery. Uh, we just need uh, aeration, high aeration, uh, and uh, twenty five degrees uh, temperature and uh, wait for 24 hours before feeding. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, I have a very uh, interesting question for Niels. Uh, marine aquaculture today is significant and uh, we expect uh, to increase its production considerably in the coming years. Uh, if all the aquaculture production is shifted towards your products, 
let's say, not all the aquaculture, but let's say that the half of the Mediterranean juvenile production is shifted towards your product. Will you be able to deliver the required volumes of live feed to the market without any shortcomings? Yes, I think it's uh, prior plankton. Uh, we already have a quite uh, significant stock uh, of uh, prior plankton, which can be shipped uh, tomorrow if uh, necessary. We have uh, we have uh, six aquaculture licenses uh, for producing uh, barnacles in Norway at uh, different sites. So uh, those have the capacity of producing 100 ton of, uh, of live feed. And uh, that is enough for uh, for uh, taking the, the full market in, in Europe uh, for uh, Bream and Bass. Uh, for, for Bream and Bass, we are not uh, intending to uh, fully replace Akemia, uh, but uh, we, we are replacing the, the more, more early phase. Uh, but... Uh, this year we it will be sold about uh, 25 tons, so we are not exploiting the capacity uh, more than 25 percent. And if needed, we can get more licenses and produce more uh, more barnacles that will produce more live feed. So uh, so that should be uh, should be possible to even meet the uh, the global market and. Uh, and uh, we are uh, we have also the possibility to produce barnacles in other parts of the world. It's uh, more than one thousand barnacle species uh, globally, so it's more uh, than enough to choose from. And uh, we have a global patent on exploiting and uh, cryopreserving those barnacles. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very informative answer. Definitely a yes. Therefore, we have here, Joanna. Uh, some people are asking how relevant do you think the inclusion of the probiotic is for the success of early co-feeding strategies uh, you showed us before? Very relevant. I, I'm convinced that one of the key uh, responsibilities for the for the success of the early introduction of the of the dry feeds is actually the feed containing the probiotic. As I said, uh, the probiotic works in three uh, different ways. So the exclusion of other pathogens that has a, a huge uh, impact, the mod modulation of the which bacteria do we have in the gut, and the bactocell itself uh, acidifies uh, the gut. So it lowers the pH and excludes, uh, I mean, the impact on Vibrio is extraordinary. We have several trials on uh, on this. But also this modulation of the of the digestive system and the, the increased uptake of nutrients, especially in terms of deformities, it is uh, already confirmed that it has uh, uh, a huge impact. So I really believe that one of the keys uh, for for the success of the early co feeding is the early colonization of the gut with the bactocell that then gives uh, several different advantages, especially at an early stage where if we do it from mouth opening, we still have an open book. The larvae have just opened their mouth and there's nothing in the gut. So it's the first colonization of the gut that if it's done properly, it will have huge benefits. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a more practical question for seafood. Uh, I suspect that this is related to the cost also, but I would like uh, Nikos or uh, uh, Ryder to answer this. Uh, uh, so, uh, we have a question. Is there any interest of sea ponds for freshwater fish, such as catfish, for example? Uh, we have not yet uh, <coughs> used the sea ponds for freshwater uh, species. Uh, but uh, as that is uh, well known, sea pods uh, or copy pods in the wild uh, are everywhere. Uh, so it is easy to find copy pods uh, in uh, really uh, hot, uh, warm waters or cold water, uh, and also uh, with uh, high salinity or low salinity. So uh, we have never tried it, but uh, <laughs> I believe that it could be uh, an option also uh, for the, um, a, a good uh, a good way of feeding uh, the freshwater fish. 
and also probably the zebrafish. Gergo. I'll keep that in mind. Something that I would like to complement as well is that uh, we should not forget that CFIT is a, is a company that has research and development in, in its DNA, which means that uh, what we are offering to the market right now is the solution that we have, but this doesn't mean that we are working thoroughly to expand our portfolio, expand our solutions uh, to the industry. In terms of, of, of production, because as the question was directed to Plantonic, it also um, is, is, is linked to, to a company like CFIT. CFIT in the, in the last year got a new emission, which means that the company now is, is, not, is, is, is considered a robust business with the resources, capital, and know-how to expand its operations. Since we operate on land, uh, it means that we can, uh, depending on the demand of the market and how the market reacts to, to the need, we will be able to, to expand uh, our, our, our production facilities. Uh, so this is much. one of the, of the magic of, of, of entering new, new value chains testing the product with customers, having an idea what would be the, the short-term and long-term demand. And based on that, we will, we will plan. But as every biological production, so we are trying to find this sweet spot to really increase in a secure and in, a, in an stable way with the challenges that every single uh, biological production company can have. Niels, do you have any any estimation of the typical consumption per million of fry, let's say, for Sebrim? Uh, per million? Um, yeah, depend uh, on how you are feeding. If uh, you are cool feeding, you have done some cool feeding trials on, uh, on Sebrim, uh, partly replacing uh, rotifers and partly replacing uh, Artemia. And then typically we have uh, been using uh, around 10 kilo for, for 1 million uh, juveniles. 10 kilo wet weight, we have to note here. Wet weight, is, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Joanna, you gave us a vision and I would like to stick on that. For when do you think the complete replacement of life is? That's the million dollar question, yes. Uh, well, if we think that this is something that we have been pursuing for 20 years, uh, it's, uh, we have gone a long way. I think right now we are actually closer uh, to, to get there. There has been important steps. There's a lot of things that are being developed and that we don't see on the market. We have a strong R&D. Uh, in Biomark, for example, working on that. I know that other companies are, are doing that as well. But as I said, it's, it has to be a combination of different things and we cannot do all the nutrition requirements and fill up all the boxes because we can't do it by, by ourselves. There's a huge nutritional knowledge that, that it needs. And I think regarding the physical characteristics, the process, that's where it has evolved so much and that we are getting uh, closer and closer. So if I need to give you a number, I hope that I will manage to do it in my time, but uh, I don't know. I don't know actually time. know our time, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for this answer. Uh, Ryder or Nikos, um, have you ever made an analysis on the nutritional profile of your product, of your copper pods? Uh, yes, Jurgo, uh, who have already done this uh, for the first moment of using uh, the C pods. Uh, if you want, give me just a second uh, because I have available this uh, table. I don't know if you see this. Can you see this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, not uh, the complete uh, table, but it is uh, most uh, important uh, uh, protein, uh, amino acids, uh, fat, uh, vitamins, minerals, etc. Uh, that uh, our R and D department believe that uh, we we need to to present this uh, to our customers. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have one, one question. May I, may I compliment something uh, to, to Nikos? Is that this is the magic of, of combining solutions. So while we are uh, asking ourselves when will be the million the million dollar question regarding inert feeds, uh, see if it has a lot to contribute to the industry while, while this development goes and to complement. We always see our solution as complementary solution that depending on the case, depending on the value chain, depending on the strategy is, is, is you know, finding the right ingredients, uh, the right solutions in the right moment. So then the, 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 the marine hatcheries can get the results that are needed to continue uh, expanding our knowledge and improving the performance of, 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 of uh, the businesses. Thank you very much. We have a fresh question coming from the audience. I'm going to bypass the rest. I will come back later to those. Uh, new life feed products and early co-feeding strategies are all fantastic innovation. Uh, I would love to understand uh, the cost difference and economic implications of using your products and strategies compared to what currently exists. I suppose this is a question for all of you. I would uh, suggest uh, uh, to stick on some percentage of increase or, or of decrease of the cost of the already used practices uh, so that we can compare the different uh, answers could we start by Nils? Yeah, so the cost of the uh, cryoplankton compared to uh, Rotifus and Artemia, so the cost uh, particles per... Uh, the extra cost per million of juveniles, let's say, produced. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. So uh, if you look uh, solely at the uh, live feed, the uh, cryoplankton is uh, more expensive than... Uh, than uh, rotifers and Artemia, ex uh, sec uh, those plankton eggs, they are uh, 0.3 euro per million uh, particles. So they are in the, in the lower range. Uh, but you, then you have so many benefits. Uh, you have uh, you have a higher uh, survival. You have uh, you are shortening the live feed period uh, often because you have an early weaning. Uh, you, uh, when you feed uh, the cryoplankton compared to rotifers, you uh, might feed only one fifth of the uh, of, uh, of the rotifers. Uh, you often need just uh, zero point three to one uh, prey per ml, uh, while for the uh, rotifers you often need uh, five ten or so. Uh, and also, uh, you have to uh, count in the uh, benefits of increased growth uh, during the ongrowing, uh, as we see uh, the late effects. Uh, uh, when you look at that, uh, it will pay back the cost of the cryoplankton many, many times. And uh, also the increased growth to fry, that uh, is also cost saving. And uh, the decrease in deformities, uh, the cost of removed fish and the cost of uh, removal of the fish with the, all the stuff you need for uh, removing the fish okay. and uh, uh, then you have uh, also uh, the early cage uh, mortality uh, you are producing more robust uh, juveniles and uh, when they are transferred to cages you normally expect some mortality but uh, with a more robust uh, larvae with a better immune system, you should expect that uh, mortality to be lower. So, uh, and then you have also the hatchery survival. So, uh, the, if you look at all those benefits, you will get paid the cryoplankton back many, many times. So, we have done a cost analysis of all this. So, uh, and each uh, hatchery might struggle uh, with uh, one or more of, of those issues. Uh, they might uh, struggle with the survival uh, at one hatchery, but uh, at another one, they could have a, they could produce uh, four or five hundred fish in, in uh, one tank, and uh, and uh, it's uh, maybe no point to produce uh, even more. But they might have other uh, issues like uh, deformities, uh, growth rates. So uh, each hatchery is unique in the, in that uh, case. Okay, thank you very much, Joanna. Any estimation on the cost difference from the traditional practices used?
you're muted, John. Sorry. Uh, I'll show you a picture. It's worth a thousand words. So uh, this is, for example, for one of, from one of the trials that we have done. And we can see this is an early co-feeding in BRIM trial compared to starting introducing on the day 15, so a more traditional protocol. And the reduction, this is production costs per million fat reduced, exactly what, to, what you were asked. And we mm -hmm. see a reduction. And uh, it's mainly to do with the increase, increased performance. So if we have a higher survival, and if we have especially lower deformities, then we will have a, a lower production cost. And this not even discussing the intangibles, which is having less pressure on the live feed production and having a lot less uh, artemia because the weaning can be done uh, much earlier. So this is the picture in terms of reduction and here with the uh, co-brain. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh... Uh, what about uh, Sifid Snyder? Do uh, do we have any any uh, estimation, Ryder? Do we have an estimation on? We have done the homework. This feature? And basically, as everybody knows, each hatcher is different. It's a different world, and even hatcheries from the same company can can have different challenges. So basically, what we have done is to gather information from different trials, different different experiences. Uh, different commercial, semi-commercial experiences gather it in, in a tool that actually we have ready when we start when we start the customization process together with the, with, the, with the customer. So basically our objective is that uh, customers use the product in a trial, in a commercial realistic environment. So we won't just come with unrealistic and, 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 and realistic numbers. Uh, we let the product and the larvae speak by itself and we have a, a, a tool that makes that a, a, the, the customer, based on the results that they get from the trial, can have an idea how much those uh, so technical performance can have an impact in the economics of the business. Uh, since we are talking about very unstandardized, we are not talking about the salmon industry that is quite standardized. We are talking about different, different value chains that is still is, is a huge difference in terms of industrialization, technology development, uh, practices, uh, technology versus manual labor. So what we have done is to, to get the average. And basically the, the number, the sweet number that we come is that when you invest in, for example, in the BREAM industry, one euro, in our product, you will get it. You will get seven euros back in return of investment. This is an average, and of course, it will vary. There are some hatcheries that, depending on the industrialization level, will have more or less. Other thing that is important is important to mention is that a, we are about to to publish some very interesting a, a results from a trial that we follow up. Uh, different, different, uh, different feeding regimes with different strategies. Remember, it's not just about the product. It's, a, it's as well how the customer finds comfortable to introduce this product. So depending the strategy, if it's co-feeding, supplement, or boosting, so of course the return of the investment will be, will be different. It's how much you invest and how much you want to get in return. And those results that we will publish will give an idea that then can be compared and could be a support to the commercial and realistic trials that we are doing together with our commercial partners and customers. Thank you very much, Ryder. Uh, uh, there is another question for Nils. Uh, this is, there is a concern, an environmental concern, Nils. Uh, Nils. Uh, how do you see the risk of barnacle nafli to be released accidentally to other parts of the world where they are not found uh, naturally? Uh, where they potentially can spread uh, to the local ecosystems? Have you considered uh, this issue? Yeah, so we have done a lot of tests on uh, on the barnacle uh, nobli. They have uh, six developmental stages, the, the nobli before they uh, become a cypreed and settle on a substrate. But uh, the cryopreservation itself makes some uh, damage on the noplia, so they cannot develop. Uh, so we are using uh, stage one noplia, and I cannot uh, go further. And um, to document this, uh, we used uh, University of Stirling in uh, Scotland, 
for uh, for uh, checking this and doing uh, a trial. And then they uh, used uh, cryopreserved uh, uh, nuclei uh, from planktonic, and then uh, they had uh, their own uh, barnacles from uh, from the wild because it was a uh, season for that uh, in Scotland. And then they uh, fed the nuclei, high quality uh, phytoplankton. And uh, the wild ones that were harvested without cry preservation, they were easy to grow to adult stages, but uh, they could not uh, grow, uh, grow the uh, over barnacles that were cry preserved to, to more to, to stage two uh, most. And then they died. They, they could uh, not. Uh, they could not develop further, and uh, yeah. So, so we have a report on this. And uh, besides the uh, Balanus canatus, it's a cosmopolitan species, uh, and uh, it cannot be found in uh, low latitudes where it's too uh, warm because it cannot reproduce in those areas. But uh, it's found all over the world, apart from the, the warmest uh, areas of the planet. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to ask a question about deformities. However, I have to stick on what uh, the audience is asking and omit my questions for the end, maybe. Leave my questions for the end. Uh, Joanna. Uh, I think uh, this is a question that is trying to combine all the different speeches we've heard so far. What about the combination of early co-feeding and barnacle copepod uh, usage without the traditional live feeds? Have Why you not? considered that? Yes. Uh, we've actually have on the plan to, to do some, some tests with the different new, let's say, uh, live feeds. I think it definitely should be explored. I see a huge potential uh, replacing totally the rotifers and their timia and get two off the shelf products that could actually work in, in combination. I see that there's definitely room to, to test it and to, to investigate it further. There can only be a win win situation if we, if we manage to, to get good results out of it. So to go a little bit farther, and uh, uh, both uh, Nils and uh, Ryder can come on board on this uh, question. Uh, is it what uh, is stability in the tank? What you are looking for by this combined usage of the different products? Would you like to avoid the instability of the rotifers and artemia in the tanks together with the bacteria problems they bring together? You're asking me. Yeah, you and yeah. the rest, because you are talking about a combined strategy. Huh? Yeah, to me, definitely. I mean, the, the if you can take the asshole of all the production, parallel production, and the personnel and the cost of stuff that that involve and the risks that that involve in in a hatchery, that is huge. If you can combine that with also all the microbiology management that that can bring into the equation and the simplification of processes, definitely. I think it's something uh, worthwhile uh, uh, exploring for sure. I mean, in an ideal world, I want to take all the life feeds uh, out, but a combination, it, to me, it only makes sense to, to, to test further, yes. What's your opinion on that, Nils? Yeah, we already have uh, feedback from uh, customers that they already have a more stable production when using uh, bioplankton. And uh, it's uh, probably because of the uh, the bacterial uh, issues uh, when they use rotifers and artemia. So, uh, so it's a much more stable production. So uh, we have that feedback from uh, kingfish producers, from, uh, from cod producers and, uh, and, and bell and brass producers. And they uh, also see uh, the gut that it's uh, less activity. They can uh, they see uh, see less uh, less bacterial activity when they use the cryo. And uh, some have even reported that uh, when they shift from rotifer to cryoplankton, if they have some uh, some vibrio issues, uh, the fish are actually um, 
the uh, the cryoplankton are are pushing out the uh, the vibrio because you never experienced any any vibrio problem with, with the cryoplankton. Thank you very much. And you, Ryder or Nikos? In our case, uh, we are focusing in offering a stable and a biosecure product that bring stability. So although you bring another factor into the production, it would not create a, an instability in terms of water quality, biosecurity, and, and, and operations itself. If, the, if, the, if we are going to be a replacement or we are going to change, or if we are going to, this is not our decision. It's the decision of the customer if they want to continue with rotifers and anthemia. What we are sure is that when we come into the equation, we will help them that they get the best of those products that they decide to, to use. Barnacles, uh, inner feet, rotifers, artemia. Our, the introduction of our product will make that they get the best of that. And this is our job. And we work based on our product that is a starter uh, life, uh, larval feed solution. We come in a very early stage and then how this transition will be, which strategy will be used is not ours as suppliers, is the customer that decides. And the larvae, of course. Thank you. However, you all of all of you, you have to allow me dreaming and trial where I'm going to use a uh, 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 cryoplankton or seafood products, and then uh, without the use of any Artemian rotifers, go directly to start the diets. From the results I saw today, I I feel that we are going to have a, a giant, uh, super robust fish, but this has to be proved. Uh, Okay, uh, I think we are near the end uh, uh, of our. Uh, uh, Yorgo, Yorgo, yeah. just just give me give me a second uh, because the question starts with uh, deformities and uh, you are the. Okay, the, the, the yeah, thank you very much for the pass. Okay, okay, thank you very uh, much. So, uh, and you are the expert in uh, okay. on this. Uh, so. Uh, we have not published uh, yet uh, something about uh, our uh, big, our huge uh, CBRIM uh, trial in uh, HCFR. Uh, but uh, we have results uh, also for your lab that uh, uh, we had uh, less deformities uh, in CBRIM uh, using uh, copypods. Uh, but uh, we are already working uh, on these uh, results and uh, we will be ready to publish uh, uh, during the uh, summer. Uh, to be honest, I was looking for these results on your presentation, but this is a matter you have to decide on. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, it is really important for us, but uh, we need some more time uh, analyzing the results. I would like to ask all the... Uh, speakers because all of you mentioned in your presentations and this is the question I would like to make to all of you. Uh, you refer to a decrease in the mortality in the uh, in the incidence of uh, deformities in your trials and I completely agree with the rationale and the results of course. Uh, however, as far as uh, we do know and you do know that um, the different deformities uh, are not always do not have always the same response. So I wonder whether you found this decrease on generally all the deformities appeared in the stocks, or you found some specific deformities that they were prone to the improvement uh, uh, action of uh, uh, your products. For example, in Nils, if I remember well, there was a very high rate of vertebral deformities in the control group. Were these deformities of a certain type or were general uh, vertebral deformities? Joanna, the same stands for your uh, results and Nikos, the same stats for your results. Yes, yeah, so should I answer on that? Um, the deformities uh, were checked by the, uh, the University of Patras. Uh, the hatchery themselves uh, would say that uh, the incidence of uh, deformities were lower but uh, the University of Patras have a more uh, elaborate check on that. Uh, so uh, so uh, some of the deformities were not considered that as very serious ones uh, from the hatchery side, but uh, still it's a huge difference. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm not sure about uh, all the different types of, uh, of deformities uh, uh, that were revealed, but uh, that could be obtained, of course. 
And you, Nikos, uh, 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 can you release uh, any results on that or uh, you would like to keep them for the moment? Uh, I just want to, to mention that uh, uh, we, in this trial, we had uh, already uh, get samples in two different uh, points, uh, one in the hatchery in the early, early stages, uh, and one in uh, around uh, one, 1.5 uh, grams uh, fish. Uh, both of them, we had uh, less deformities. Uh, we had a better uh, swim bladder inf infection uh, and the deformities, uh, we talk about uh, the, the fins, uh, the operculum. Uh, so uh, with, uh, uh, with the use of uh, copy pods, we had better results uh, in both uh, different, uh, in these different uh, uh, time, uh, time points. And you, Joanna, you showed us some very nice results on the beneficial effect of your strategy on hemalordosis, which are deformity that appears later on, but obviously it is affected by what, by what happened in the early environment of the fish. Do you have any other results on some deformities that could be improved by your strategy? Yeah, well... Let me start by making a parenthesis because as, as you know, as we all know, the deformities is a complicated process and it's not mm -hmm. just related to the feet. There's a lot of other factors affecting it. So when you analyze each of the trials and you analyze each of the results and even in, in hatchery conditions, you have to understand the background and you need to understand what is actually the control giving because some hatcheries will be more prone to some deformities than others uh, uh, and so on. But what, what we have seen in our uh, case is more uh, dealing with deformity at, at uh, vertebral levels and uh, lordosis uh, will also play, play an effect. But when we talk about um, the vertebral column, so uh, kyphosis, and when we're talking about also the all the head and the jaw uh, deformities there's uh, there's an impact on uh, on the deformities and in some cases also with the with the operculum but for example what we have also documentation and we have seen with the bactocell is in the incidence also on the on the vertebral column so we're talking about specifically on on uh, vertebral uh, impacts thank you very much uh... If we don't, do not have any other question, I think that we have covered uh, a major part of uh, the interest on uh, the products presented and on the strategies presented. I'm very pleased to see so big uh, steps forward, uh, the production of uh, not only uh, large quantities of juveniles, but uh, robust juveniles of high quality, and uh, the companies are paying attention to issues like sustainability, environmental sustainability, feasibility. You take into account the hatcheries characteristic, uh, characteristics, which are quite specific, local, although they use the same strategies. Uh, thank you all for inviting me in this fruitful event. And I would like to pass now uh, uh, to Lucia uh, to close. Uh, uh, the event. Well, thank you, George, for your great job moderating and thanks to all the speakers for the great presentations and thanks everyone for joining in. We hope this webinar has been informative and inspiring and this, these solutions are valuable for your hatcheries. If you want to stay up to date on the latest news on aquaculture hatcheries, don't forget to subscribe for free to our publications on our website, hatcheryfm.com. See you next time. Goodbye.